Okay, we'll continue to talk about sums of random variables and now about limits. So what I mean by limit is I want to try to understand what happens to the sum of random variables x1 up to xn as the number of variables n increases and really goes to infinity. So for a very large n, how do these random variables behave? And specifically, how does their sum behave? And the answer depends on normalization. So if x1 through xn are iid and our, I take their average, our intuition is going to tell us that this average, which is just 1 over n times the sum of n, that should look like the mean. And that's correct. So as n gets larger, this should get closer and closer to the mean. And in fact, in the previous video, we saw that indeed um, the average of this average is the mean and its variance is 1 over n times the variance of x. So as n increases, the variance collapses, and indeed it will get closer to the mean. But it turns out that 1 over root n of this sum will behave more like a Gaussian random variable. Okay, so we have to be a little bit careful about what we mean by um, taking the average or the sum. So it depends on this normalization term in front. Okay, and let's just try to make these notions precise. Okay, these two notions that if I take the average, it's going to look like the mean. And if I take one over root n times the sum, that's going to look Gaussian. Okay, so we need a little bit of uh, more uh, conceptual framework. We need an infinite sequence of random variables, x1, x2 on up. And we're going to specify those by some kind of joint CDF. If it's discrete, we're going to use a joint PMF. And um, we're going to use a joint PDF for the continuous case. In fact, we're going to have a collection of these. And what that means is for every possible finite subset of random variables in this infinite sequence, we have some joint PMF or PDF that defines them, right? So if you think about x1, x3, x29, x52, there's a joint PMF for that. If you think about x2, x5, x8, there's a joint PMF for that and so on. So for um, what we're also going to do is we're going to assume that this is an IID sequence of random variables, meaning that um, every possible subset, so every possible finite subset you can think of is IID according to the definition that we had on the previous video, which is that they're independent and identically distributed. So they have the same marginal PMF in the discrete case and the same marginal PDF in the continuous case. Okay, we're also going to recall this idea of a sample mean. So if I give you a finite sequence of random variables, x1 up to xn, the sample mean is just their average, all right? So I just take the sum and I divide it by n, okay? That's the sample mean, m sub n. The weak law of large numbers tells us that if I have an IID sequence of random variables, x1, x2 on up, with finite means, okay, they all have the same means because they're ID, the mean is mu, and any epsilon greater than zero, then the limit of the probability that the sample mean deviates from its true mean by more than epsilon, the limit of that probability is zero. So as you increase n, the chance that you lie more than epsilon away from the true mean goes to zero. And you're allowed to pick any epsilon that you want so long as it's greater than zero. Okay, so the idea here intuitively is that given a tolerance epsilon, however small you like, and large enough n, the sample mean stays within epsilon of the true mean with probability that gets very, very close to one. Okay, meaning that the probability that it doesn't happen goes to zero. So why is this true? It turns out this is very easy for us to show in the special case where the variances of x are finite. Um, you might even be thinking like, when is it not finite? When is the variance infinite? There are um, some families of random variables for which that's true. Basically just don't worry about it. Let's just focus on the finite variance case. The mean of the sample mean is mu and its variance is just sigma squared over n. So that's something we saw in the previous video. So what we can do now is we just apply Chebyshev's inequality, which will tell us that the probability that something deviates from its mean by more than epsilon is its variance over epsilon squared. And in this case, the variance is sigma squared over n, where sigma squared is the variance of um, 
these random variables x1 up to xn. Okay, and this clearly goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So I'm done. So I see that this probability of deviating um, by more than epsilon is going to zero. Okay, let's try to visualize this through an example. Okay, in my example, all I'm going to do is have x1 um, up to xn, right? So I'm going to, in this case, just look at a finite sequence. And I'm going to say that they're iid Bernoulli 1 half, all right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take their sample mean, and I'm going to plot the exact um, PMF of the sample mean, and I'm going to look at it and try to visualize that the probability that the sample mean um, lies outside a small interval around the true mean goes to zero. Okay, so what I want to see is the probability that m of n minus a half, that's the true mean, greater than a tenth goes to zero. Okay, a tenth is going to be my tolerance because I'm just plotting this for you to see. Okay, so here's my first plot for n equals 10. Here is the PMF plot. And what I'm going to do is show you in orange here what is the um, range where, or the interval where the mean deviates by more than a tenth from the true mean. So the sample mean here minus the true mean mu is larger than a tenth because the true mean is 0.5. And what I've done is highlighted 0 up to 0.4 and 0.6 up to 1. Those are the intervals where I've gone more than a tenth away from my true mean. And you can see that the probability that lies above this orange region is actually pretty large. Let's see what happens at n equals 50. So we get a different PMF now. And you can see I can highlight the same region and the total mass there does seem to be a bit smaller for the probability that I've gone away from the true mean by more than a tenth. And for 100, you can see that it's really basically uh, collapsed. There's still a little bit left, but it's clearly going to zero. So the probability of these points that lie above these orange um, regions is really getting smaller. So what's happening as n is increasing, the probability that the sample mean minus the true mean is greater than a tenth is decreasing. And it's doing so as we predicted by the weak law of large numbers. And one thing that you can't see on this plot is that it's actually decreasing faster than predicted by the weak law of large numbers in the way that we proved it using Shebyshev's inequality, because Shebyshev's inequality is pretty conservative. Um, so you can actually get a sharper convergence for this specific Bernoulli case, but don't worry about that. Um, for now. The main thing that you might be wondering is why are we including this tolerance epsilon? It seems like the sample mean should really be converging to the true mean mu exactly. Okay, and that does turn out to be the case. All right, so the strong law of, of large numbers says that for any IID sequence, right, x1, x2, and so on, with finite means, um, e of xi equals mu, so they all have the same mean because they're iid. The limit of the probability that m is equal to mu exactly is 1. Okay, so eventually this sample mean does become exactly equal to the true mean. Okay, and here this, what I wrote here is maybe a little bit imprecise. Usually people like to write this in terms of the original sample space, so the omegas in the sample space for which this is true, the total probability of that is going to 1 but we're just gonna leave that out for now. Um, the reason you might prefer the weak law over the strong law is it's often easier to give quantitative estimates um, for finite n about how much probability is left in the um, range outside. Um, so this kind of, this area where you have deviated from the true mean, it's easier to quantify that. Whereas the strong law is really a statement about um, exact equality in the limit. And we're not gonna look at a derivation. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to look at for limits is what's called the central limit theorem. Okay, what it says, I'm going to give you the precise statement first and then try to give you intuition. So for any IID sequence x1 up to um, on up to infinity with finite mean mu and variance sigma squared, let Sn be the sum of these random variables. Then the CDF of Yn, which is Sn minus n mu, divided by sigma times square root of n. Okay, so let, let's just think about that for a second. I take the sum, I subtract n times mu, which is the mean of the sum, 
and I divide by sigma, which is the standard deviation of a single random variable, times root n. And that root n is trying to achieve what I said in the beginning of this video. I'm trying to achieve something like taking 1 over root n times the sum. So this object, y of n, so its CDF converges to the standard normal CDF for any value of y, meaning that the limit of its CDF is equal as n goes to infinity to the standard normal CDF. And you can actually make this, um, you know, you can actually give some sharper estimates, so you can actually try to quantify how far you are from the normal CDF, but we're not going to do that here. The main thing I want you to remember is that 1 over root n of the sum of iid random variables looks Gaussian when n gets large. Okay, so 1 over n times the sum converges to the mean, whereas 1 over root n, the sum looks Gaussian. And what this is telling you intuitively is the sum of many small independent effects looks Gaussian eventually. Okay, let's look at this visually again. We're going to go back to the same example we had before. So I'm going to have x1, x2, and so on be iid Bernoulli 1 half. Okay, and I'm going to define yn exactly as above. It's their sum minus n times the mean divided by their standard deviation times root n. So if I have n equals 10, here's a plot of the CDF of y of n defined above and the standard normal CDF for Gaussian 0, 1. And you can see that it does go right, it just kind of trace right through that, um, you know, this kind of staircase. But maybe it bounces, you know, the they do kind of uh, deviate a little bit. But if I go up to n equals 25, I can see that it's a much better approximation. And at n equals 100, it's kind of hard to see the difference. And you can quickly imagine that as n goes to infinity, that these, that this f of y n is converging to uh, phi of y. Okay, so let's use this uh, to do some calculations. Okay, so here's how I'm going to use it. Let's say that I give you 100 random variables, x1 up to x100, and I tell you they're iid geometric 2, so with parameter 2. So what I want to do is, using the central limit theorem, I want to approximate um, a prob an, a, the probability of an event. Okay, so I'm going to approximate the probability that sum, uh, that the sum, which in this case is s100, so the sum of x1 up to x100, that that sum exceeds 80. Okay, so this is going to be an approximation. It's not going to be exact. So the mean of these x i's is 1 half because they're geometric 1, 2. The variance is 1 fourth, again, because they're geometric 2. And geometric lambda has mean 1 over lambda, variance 1 over lambda squared. That's what I'm using here. Y of n here is y of 100. So it's going to be the sum s100 minus 100 times the mean, which is a half divided by the square root of 100 times a fourth. So that's just the square root of n times the square root of the variance, one fourth, which is the standard deviation. And I know that I can approximate the CDF of this y with the standard normal CDF. Okay, so the central limit theorem says that this f of y 100 converges to phi of y, but we're just going to use it as an approximation for n equals 100, even though the only thing I've really told you is in the limit it's true, but let's just take it as an approximation for y equals 100. So my goal here is to say something about this event that the sum exceeds 80, and to do that what I have to do is manipulate this event, s of 100 is greater than 80, into something that looks like y of 100 is less than some value. And the reason I want to do that is what I have is an approximation for the CDF of y100, which tells me the probability that y100 is less than or equal to things. Okay, so I just need to work that out. Okay, and once I have that, I'm just going to apply the central limit theorem approximation um, directly. Okay, so that's great. Okay, so what I have is the probability that s100 is greater than 80. So to get this closer to y, the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 100 times a half from both sides. So I'm subtracting n times the mean from both sides. So these are still the same um, probability because I haven't changed anything in terms of the, uh, the underlying event in the sample space because I've just subtracted the same number from both sides. 
right? And so I'm just going to uh, simplify the right-hand side. So I still have S100 minus 100 times a half minus 830. So that's 80 minus 50. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 100 um, times the square root of, so sorry, the square root of 100 times 1 fourth. So I'm just dividing both sides by that. This turns out to just be um, the square root of 25, which is just going to be 5. So I'm really dividing both sides by 5. So now what I've gotten is the probability of y100 on the left. So if you look above, this is exactly the form of y100. And on the right-hand side, I have um, 6, because 30 divided by 5 is 6. Okay, using the complement property, this is 1 minus the probability that y100 is less than or equal to 6. So this is just approximately 1 minus the standard normal CDF evaluated at 6. And that's it. That's how I can use the central limit theorem to do quick and easy approximations of probabilities of pretty complicated events for which I don't directly have um, the PMF in that situation. And that's it.